Okay, morning, friends. We start with the presentation of young know, presentation of Terry Ordley. Uh, you all might know him. He is a famous professor. He's confessed with uh, photography since a long time, and uh, especially with atlases and also national atlases. And he wrote some. Uh, I remember that he wrote uh, some years ago something about okay something about uh, national atlases where they uh, appear where they are from and uh, also um, now he will present something uh, merchants of the national atlas concept that means that uh, where has it all started yes. So, Ferian, please. No, that's not the right place. So I'm sure he's not talking about the National Atlas of Hungary, although he knows him. So maybe I can tell a short story before it starts. I was with very young and last low Saint I uh, years ago it was in Algeria and they are planning um, an atlas of Algeria, the school atlas, and we were there you know, for four days. Yes. yes. Yeah, and it was a really funny <laughs> convention because they planned to do an atlas in one year. So um, we both uh, know that but really they did it because they copied half of the atlas of uh, the school atlas of switzerland so they adapted it and uh, we finally said okay it's okay <laughs> let's do that like this it's not the bad solution and about 30 000 schools in algeria are using a cooperation between algerian and swiss school atlas so very please we're ready to start okay thank you let me first congratulate the Institute of Geographic National with its 150th anniversary. And since it played a very important role in the development of national atlases, I thought it would be fitting to give this talk on the emergence of the national atlas concept. The first mention of the term national atlas was found in English in an advertisement in the Oxford Journal in 1793. And it referred to a national atlas of France to be produced by John Wallace in London. The atlas he intended to produce was copied from a French publication, the Atlas National. In France, the term Atlas National was coined in the course of the 1789 revolution as a follow up to the demarcation of the new administrative subdivisions of. Uh, uh, in departments instead of in the old provinces. One of the first products of the Bureau de l'Atlas National set up for this purpose was the Atlas National et Topographique de la France en département, published in 1795. With a map emblem still very much reminiscent of the Ancien Regime. 
The Atlas contains an overview map of France, Island, and 83 maps, each of the different departments. They were all on the same scale and cut out, could be assembled or pasted together to form a giant map of the country. It was essentially a topographic atlas, be it a very detailed one. It was state sponsored by the uh, Sorry, it was state sponsored as the Bureau de l'Atlas National had been set up by the Assemblée Nationale, that is by Parliament. Here yeah, you see one of these detailed department maps. The concept was kept alive as similar Atlas Nationaux were published in France in the 19th century, for example, by Levasseur in the 1840s. It wasn't what we nowadays would consider to be a national atlas, but it showed that at least a national atlas should be based upon detailed topographic knowledge of the country. In Britain, the term national atlas in the 19th century would rather refer to a general reference world atlas catering for the national market. Examples are the National Atlas of General Geography by Alexander Keith Johnston and the National Atlas by John Haywood in the 1870s. But in 19th century continental Europe, the term National Atlas would refer to atlases containing detailed topographic map covering a nation state. As more and more geospatial information would become available during the 19th century, the advent of atlases that would bring together detailed topographical, physical, and socio-economic information for countries would be a matter of time. There was the gathering of physical information speeded up and channeled by Humboldt, Berghaus, and Johnston starting from the beginning of the 19th century. And there was the gathering of statistical information on the population and its endeavors, that is, socio-economic data, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. This first occurred in centrally governed states like Austria, Russia, and France. To cope with this information revolution, to bring it in a digestible form, to visualize it together in an atlas to be a logical next step. In retrospect, a number of atlases published in the 19th and 20th century was later dubbed to belong to the National Atlas category. That is especially after the formation by the International Geographical Union in 1956 of the Commission National Atlases, chaired by Konstantin Salischev, who was able to convene a large number of geographers involved in national atlas production worldwide. In four years, they worked out the contents of what, in their opinion, should compose a national atlas. And this was published in 1960 in the Commission report called Atlas National, that is, National Atlases, History, Analysis, Ways of Perfecting Them, and Unification. The Commission defined and codified the concept and produced lists of subject matter to be visualized in national atlases. The standardization aimed for in this visualization was to be extended to the actual portrayal of the spatial information. Maps were to be produced at specific scales, and subcommissions were organized in the 1960s, which had to come up with proposals for the best way to map each of the various topics to be incorporated in the atlas. That is, they had to develop standard legends. The grand idea behind this was the idea that if all maps in the national atlases would follow these standardized legends, all the atlases put together would form a national atlas of the world. This grand idea was stated for the first time by Salischev at the seventh plenary meeting of the Commission on National Atlases held here at the IGN in Madrid. April 1970. What made the address of a country a national address? What criteria had to be met? The Commission stated it had to contain maps of the country's physical environment, its population, its economy, cultural issues, and its administrative structure. 
The physical environment had to be portrayed with geological, hydrological, climatological, soil, forestry, and fauna maps. The population had to be portrayed according to its distribution and density, age, gender, and evolution. To be extended is maps of social parameters. The economy of a country should be portrayed as maps on agriculture, manufacturing, tertiary production, commercial trade, finance, and transportation. Cultural aspects should be portrayed by maps of education and the distribution of cultural and scientific establishments. The maps had to be as detailed as possible, had to be of a scientific nature, suitable for problem solving, and most important, the various themes had to be visualized in such a way that all of them would be compared to one another. As the production of the national atlas was the most labor-intensive endeavor, involving many state institutions necessary for gathering the geospatial data, it was logical that the national atlas would be state-sponsored. The ITU National Atlas Commission reviewed the atlases produced before 1960 and identified previous cartographic works that answered its definition of national atlases, the first being the Atlas de Finlande. This atlas was thus canonized as the first answering the Commission's criteria for a national atlas, and this selection drew many comments. Scholars in many countries objected. German cartographer Scharfe claimed that the 1828 administrative statistical atlas of Prussia by Ferdinand von Döring should be regarded as the first national atlas, even if it contained mainly administrative maps. It set the model, though, as it contained 22 thematic maps of the same state, Prussia, all at the same scale, thus providing perfect conditions for map comparison. According to Scharfe, it also contained the first population density map, which is displayed here. The concept being so new that it was still stated as the ratio of the population and the surface area. The 1847 to 1870 Atlas de España by Francisco Coelho was proposed also, although it was strictly topographical. Werner Stams, assisting ITU Commission member Edgar Lehmann, claimed two more German atlases belonged to the National Atlas Group, and these were the 1860 Atlas of Saxony and the 1878 Atlas of the German Empire. The latter atlas stands out as the first atlas that was produced as proof of the existence of a new state, as the German Empire had been founded in 1871. The new Germany presented itself in this atlas to the world in 25 physical, demographic, economic and cultural maps, amongst which religion and this language map. It is indeed remarkable that these German contributions to the development of the national atlas concept were ignored by the Commission. In the United States, Montmonier claimed that the 1876 Statistical Atlas of the United States by Francis Walker should have been regarded as one of the early national atlases, even though the US member of the ITU Commission, Carlton Barnes, didn't see the need to include it. Neither did the editor of the 1970 National Address of the United States. This one, by Francis Walker, contained 52 plates, including physical maps, maps based on population, social and industrial statistics, and maps and diagrams on title statistics. It portrayed only half the country, as the western half hadn't been surveyed as yet, and maps on cattle, industrial production and cultural issues were missing. On the other hand, for a long time it was the only national atlas to include maps on wealth, indebtedness and taxation. The 1895 Survey Atlas of Scotland by John Bartholomew 
was comparable to the actors of sexual work in its limited scope, but was more advanced in its thematic methodology. Its 62 plates contained 11 maps of the whole country, to which plans of major urban centers were added. It was regarded as the first complex regional atlas, which is to say that had the country been independent, it would have been the first national atlas. The Atlas de Finlande, here another plate from it, now hailed as the first national atlas, published in 1899 in French by the Finnish Geographical Society. It contained 12 maps on the physical environment, six demographical plates, nine on the economy, five on infrastructure, amongst which this map of the lighthouses on the coast, and three on history. The Atlas of Canada, the first edition of which was published in 1906, was strong on infrastructure, like the one from Finland, and on population but for most items relied on diagrams instead of maps. Next to national atlases, the ITU Commission also focused on regional atlases, that is a more problem-oriented type of atlas. In 1964, the Commission report Regional Atlases was published, in which maps of the physical environment and natural resources were described. And propositions on standardizing these maps were discussed. In 1968, the follow-up on socio-economic maps in complex atlases was published. Unfortunately, only in Russian described the editorial production process of regional atlases on the example of the 1963 Atlas of the Pushtanai Atlas, now in, uh, situated in Kazakhstan. It broke new ground in the description how to attune the visualization of different phenomena to each other. The Commission regarded regional atlases as practical guides for solving the problems of rational use of natural resources, nature protection, and the most efficient territorial organization of the productive forces and regional planning. You recognize the, the socialist uh, jargon. In 1972, the Commission published a, an additional guide for the production of environmental maps titled Methods for Creating Integrated Regional Addresses, focusing on maps and um, nature. Maps of Nature. The, pu the publication work of the Commission culminated in 1976 in the 600-page volume uh, or manual called Complex Regional Atlases at, at right here, a handbook that presented the summary of the Soviet experience in national regional atlas production with extensive descriptions of the requirements of different thematic map types. In 1972, the mandate of the ITU Commission was officially extended to regional addresses, thus adapting to current practice. Edgar Lehmann from Leipzig in Germany took over as Commission Chair. One of the new terms of reference of the Commission was the production of supranational addresses. Another was the inclusion of more environmental and urban maps in national and regional atlases. Lehmann had published extensively on the National Atlas concept, was the editor-in-chief of the National Atlas of the German Democratic Republic. In view of the inventive ways of overcoming the Cold War restraints on publishing strategic data, it was one of the best national atlases produced. Here on the map of the right, you can see the orientation towards animal or towards vegetable production in East German agriculture. In the final report on this term as Commission Chair, Lehmann proposed as new terms of reference the publication of a guidebook on atlas preparation. So this was 1976, the, the name. More attention for town structure maps and for environmental themes. 
when the boards of ITU and ICA in 1976 decided to continue the Atlas Commission as a joint ITU ICA working group. The suggestion in Lehman's report was adopted as the new cooperative body was to focus on environmental emphasis. The new chairman was to be Francisco Vasquez Maure, at the time the editor of the National Atlas of Spain. The tasks of the joint working group were to collect data on addresses on the environment and environmental maps in national, urban, and regional addresses and analyze them systematically in order to compare the subject matter and the procedures used in mapping them. On the basis of this analysis, guidelines were to be worked out and recommended for the preparation of environmental analysis. It was decided to publish a booklet gathering specific examples of environmental maps. This was realized and distributed by the Instituto Geographico Nacional in 1980. Described for a number of environmental topics, data collection, processing, and visualization strategies with samples of the resulting maps. For its next term, the Commission retained the same terms of reference, focusing on recommendations regarding the inclusion of environmental maps in national and regional agencies, but added the study of database problems for environment maps. Pascal Smarve died in the autumn of 1982, and David Bickmore from the United Kingdom became acting chair, so that he became the editor of the second volume on examples of environmental maps that could be distributed to the ICA and the ITU conferences. ICA at that time had decided to, long, to no longer have their conferences linked to those of the International Geographic Union. When the working group was reinstated for a new term in 1984, with Big as chair, the terms of reference completely changed, that is, into the preparation of a detailed study on a digital world base map for environmental science. The ICSU, now the International Council for Science, awarded the research grant to enable the working group to identify scientific evidence of the need for topographic data in digital form on a global scale. To that end, many environmental institutions worldwide were contacted regarding their topographic requirements, and this resulted in a project to produce a digital data with a global base map in vector format. The main problem for producing such a database was the funding, and apparently the working group was unable to solve this on an international basis. And in 1987, the working group was discontinued by both ITU and ICA, although the initiative eventually ended as the digital chart of the world. It was the time of the quantitative revolution in geography, when geographers lost their interest in maps and cartographers were dissatisfied with the new direction of the working group. In 1986, at the Autocanto meeting in London, Ben Driestedt from the National Land Survey of Sweden had chaired a workshop on national atlases, and this proved so successful that ICA instituted an ad hoc working group on national atlases, and next year, in 1987, at the ICA General Assembly in Morelia, in Mexico, the ICA Commission on National Atlases was created with Ben Driestedt as chairperson. A description of the early history of the Commission can be found in the ICA Atlas Commission website with memorable meetings in Madrid in 1992, organized by Fernando Aranas and Lola Abad, and in 2005, organized by Rufino Jerez. Even when the term national atlases is accepted, as referring to atlases dedicated to a specific country, is a complete and detailed representation of all its social, economic, physical, and 
cultural aspects in such a way that this can be compared. There are still different views as how this framework should be filled in. The changing trends in the conception and functions of national addresses have been studied in detail by Christian Ditscher in 1999. He distinguished six national address production periods, each with their own characteristics. During the first period in which these addresses were produced, physical and demographic data were highlighted, and the new communications infrastructure was focused on as well. Knowledge of physical phenomena was regarded as a condition for understanding social economic connections. In the second interwar period, political emancipation led to new countries introducing themselves, but national addresses served to as inventories of resources. After the Second World War, maps of social cultural phenomena increased and they became more practice oriented. The Swedish national address here led the way also in quantifying parameters. In the 1960s, there was a trend to reduce the scales of the maps and thus the size of national addresses. In the 1970s, the complex and um, synthesis maps advocated by the ITU Commission were also adopted in the West for the first time in the 1969 Regional Economic Atlas of Ontario on display. After 1980, the standards proposed in 1960 no longer satisfied the requirements of Atlas cartography. On the one hand, because of the use of new digital technology, and on the other hand, because of a change in outlook. No longer were national atlases solely seen as statements of matching of achievements and aspirations. Instead, they became increasingly seen as instruments for the elaboration of social economic policies and consequently as problem solving tools. This led to favoring aspects relevant to the nation's inhabitants at the expense of scientific topics. This new focus also served to target, next to the scientific community, a new audience, well educated laymen interested in their environment. The educational function of national efforts got more attention as well. An example of national efforts is becoming more human based than area based is the second edition of the National Atlas of Environments, produced in the 1980s, which focused on visualizing all phenomena related to life, work, distribution, welfare, and recreation of and communication between the inhabitants of the Netherlands. It aimed, if not at solving, and at least at providing more insight into its spatial problems. A similar view was reflected in the National Atlas Rundsleben in Deutschland, produced between 1999 and 2006, with its problem oriented presentation, design, and layout adapted to a large audience, subdivided in the number of topical volumes that could each be acquired separately. And the same concept is valid for the National Atlas of Spain, with some 40 different volumes. After the 1980s, an enormous increase in geospatial data brought further change in the National Atlas concept and led to, to the production of National Atlas information systems, in which the National Atlas, either on paper or on screen, is only the visual portal to underlying national atlas database. But the concept, the most detailed presentation of the spatial aspects of a nation in order to further welfare of its inhabitants is still very much alive, as can also be seen in the national atlas of the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting and elaborate presentation. Um, I hope that we can 
published this contribution also on the website of the commission. If you agree. Yes, I did. Thank you. There might be a time for one question or two. Why is there time for one question? Yes, sir. Okay. From the audience, please. Yeah. Ready? Well, the, uh, actually, the concept of information is changing a little bit. Uh, we focus uh, more and more on regional addresses as national addresses because they are produced to show a nation of the national state. So the nation is an inclusive concept of the ethnic the language, the culture. One would be, one example would be the, uh, sorry, the Atlas of Catalonia, which is a regional atlas, but comes in terms of a, of a national atlas, which is actually not a national state, but an area that seeks for independence. We have loads and loads of these areas in Europe. Is this national atlas concept that Salichev outlined and um, I, I think he, the, the concept that he outlined is outdated because the themes that he concentrated on are a bit outdated, not relevant anymore to peasant societies. But in fact, that uh, could either refer to, to a, a region or a nation. Is it the same relevant at all anymore for the proper concept? Other questions? Uh, Thomas, please. Very much thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. We're showing some, but I'm going to have this opinion. It's also always asking myself, which is the oldest national atlas of the theory to well, Schaffer said in 1828 that Russian um, was actually the administrative system that she was going to be a national president. I think in, in, in hindsight, uh, Schaffer was uh, quite right. But, but you must remember this, this Atlas Commission uh, operated in, in, the, in the wake of the Second World War. And, and, and German atlases were not quite salon fee at, uh, <laughs> at the time. So that is, I think that's why they were not, uh, not regarded uh, at the time. And, and, and Finland at the time was a satellite state of the Soviet Union, so they could easily uh, nominate this one as the, as the first. Okay, um, last question. Um, if we relation to what Eddie said, this is indeed really important. And however, I would like to highlight one thing with these regional national atlases. And for instance, with Catalonia, with the Basque Country, if you for well, the are considered nationalities in our constitution and in their autonomy status, and they are declared as being so from an administrative point of view. And um, however, now you're talking about a cultural nation. If you look at, for instance, Catalonia, the language is spoken not only in the, re in the administrative territory of Catalonia, but it's also spoken in Valencia, Balearic Islands, Perpignan, Andorra. However, those territories are not included in the Atlas. So, what uh, these regions, nations, nationalities, how we want to call them, are doing is the same principle as a national atlas, but the, the territory is just different. It's not a, a state, a European state. It's a European region, nationality, however they call it. So the principle is basically the same. They don't focus on a cultural nationality or a cultural nation. They go to an uh, administrative territory. So it's basically the same. Quite, quite interesting because they are not they are partly relying on national database, um, but their uh, the content of the addresses are mainly then, uh, adjusted according to what this uh, kind of nation uh, either 
to what you're saying, I'm thinking, of course, of mass surgery. Um, well, they don't have, there is an institute in Catalonia, a very powerful, very good institute, a cartographic institute in Catalonia. We don't have that in the mass surgery, but we do have maps. And if you look at it, it, from a cultural point of view, from a linguistic point of view, the northern part of Navarre, which is not Basque surgery, we consider ourselves as being Basque. Speak Basque, and everybody speaks Basque there. And on the other side, there are territories which are, from an administrative point of view, part of the Basque country where no Basque is spoken. So, from a cultural point of view, the nation, or what you were calling nation or nationality, is a concept. However, from an administrative point, it's another concept. And what is uh, drawn on the maps is not the cultural part. Or sometimes it is, but not always. Usually it, it sticks to the administrative uh, concepts, let us say. And of course, it is indeed driven by the government in order to, especially in, like in Spain, for instance, um, those nationalities which have a, um, a nationalist party in power, the regional government, they, of course, it's very important for them to have the nation the territory and the map on which their power is important. So, of course, the address is indeed very well driven and with a very specific purpose. I agree with you fully. I'm very We are now discussing nowadays the concept of, of atlases, what is the definition of an atlas and so on. Um, uh, from your point of view, what can be the role of a national atlas today? Helping to solve, helping to, to make the inhabitants of the country aware of the problems that are facing them and giving directions on, on how, to, how to solve them. That, that would be the purpose, that would be the, the, the narrative also to, 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 to follow. Not only to show maps, but to um, point out some difficulties where in life and yeah. help people to understand yeah. what is yeah. going so, on. So awareness and, and helping them to, to overcome the, the issues. Okay. Thank you very much and a uh, big hand for
So here Connex here for instance let us proceed to the second keynote uh, which will be presented by uh, Gabor Yamchak uh, or Yamchak Gabor to say this in Hungarian mode. Um, he is teaching for he teaches at the London University and in Budapest at the Department of Photography and Geoinformatics. He is also a member of the United Nations Group of Experts on the Netherlands, on game. His research focuses on cartography, geography, and languages with a special focus on place names. And he was uh, responsible for the use of place names in the new Hungarian National Atlas, which has been published in two volumes so far in the volume on natural resources and in the second volume on society. Two more volumes are to follow. And um, yes, and it's the most classic, it's, it's certainly one of the best um, addresses in recent times. It's received also an award at ICC in Florence. Um, and uh, what is specific uh, with this atlas, it does not only portray Hungary in the mode of insular maps, for instance, uh, many maps in this atlas portray really larger territories, the territory also of the former Hungarian kingdom, so larger parts of Central Europe, actually. And this uh, means a special challenge for place names, of course. And another challenge is the uh, intention of this atlas uh, to um, include also minority names, uh, to show or to render also minority names. And the address has been published or is published in a Hungarian version and in an English version. And the English version uses English exonyms, of course, if English exonyms exist for a certain basis. So it's a really a complex picture, especially as regards place names. And it will be very interesting to hear about the principle of place name rendering in this atlas. Please, Gabor, you have some. Thank you for this introduction, and I thank Professor Jordan too for inviting me to be uh, one of the key speakers today. Um, I will concentrate only on one topic, on toponymy, um, and uh, I will give a view of how the toponymy in the Hungarian national addresses, either in the Hungarian or English language editions, they changed in the past a bit more than five decades. Um, just to, to show the outlook of, of these atlases, most of them, I would say all of them, are, are a beautiful execution. Um, the one published in 1967, this was the first. Um, that time was the peak of the socialist and communist system in Hungary. Um, the other one, 20 years later, from 89, uh, was uh, presented at the International Cartographic Conference in Budapest and was completed almost in, in, the, in the last hours uh, before the ICA conference. And that time, 1989, uh, was the year of the collapse of, of the socialist or communist state in Hungary. Sometimes I say that the 1989 year was as important for Central Europe as the French Revolution in 1789, 200 years before. Um, the Hungary maps were, was published in as a, as a preliminary atlas after the second uh, national atlas of Hungary. They preceded the third one that I'm going to talk about a bit later, not much later anyway. Um, it's interesting that the map, the, the Hungary maps appeared in English and two years later that was published in Hungarian as well, while the Geographical Research Institute also tested the, the staff and the, and the cooperating partners, but they, they could go on with the project of the third national atlas of Hungary. Um, and this is that uh, appeared in 2018 in English and Hungarian. Excuse me. Oh, okay. 
I think this keeps some distance. Um, so the one, uh, the, the one that appeared in 2018, uh, that was a volume on the natural environment in both languages at the same time, obviously, and the same year. And the 2021 volumes, two volumes uh, concentrated on society. <laughs> I'm going to talk only about the use of toponyms and about the changes of the toponyms of these five decades. Um, I could start even part one and part one as a, as a kind of a summary. And there will be another summary at the end, of course. But I collected the, the major, say, principles of uh, using place names in the atlases. Uh, as you see, the local names policy prevailed in the, in the early years, say early years, um, which meant that uh, the Hungarian names were given only in parentheses after the local names after the endonyms. At least they were considered endonyms in that time when we had a different uh, definition of endonym and exonym. So in those times, they were considered, of course, the Hungarian names or exonyms outside the border or territory of Hungary. Um, in the 89 edition, which was uh, in one volume, but the Hungarian English edition, there, there were max in English, well, in Hungarian English titles, and also the legend was explained in English, but the maps were all in Hungarian. And the English language uh, explanatory text used geographical names, of course, also of Hungary, or mostly of Hungary, but many of them you couldn't identify on the maps because the maps were Hungarian, just the titles and the legend was in English. Um, in the preliminary atlas, as I would say, uh, uh, local names policy went on, and but in the English edition, uh, English names were used only when the, there was an English name, but that was only just one two percent of the place names, like Prague or Vienna. But for the geographical names, for landscape names, for physical geographical features, we use the English translation of names also outside Hungary and within Hungary. In the Hungarian edition, we did the same. Local names were used, but I would say the same, but in the opposite meaning, that the local names were used only when there were no Hungarian names for that place. And the area that the maps covered, uh, probably all of them belong to the Hungarian Kingdom or the Hungar Austro-Hungarian Empire. So for everything, almost for everything, we had a Hungarian name well, that we consider as part of the Hungarian language of the heritage of the, of the mother tongue. And in the last two volumes of the National Atlas, uh, in the Hungarian in addition, we kept on with the, with the former idea that uh, local names were used if no Hungarian names were known to that place, either a settlement or, a, uh, or any other physical feature. In the English edition, which appeared in the same year, also in 2018 and 21, the local names were used in the English edition and in a few cases. Uh, uh, the English uh, exonyms as well. What is really a novelty there that uh, we decided, well, first of all, with the, with the leadership of Professor Kocic, the head of the Geographical Research Institute, that the Hungarian minority names should be preserved and shown also in the English language edition of the Atlas, where the Hungarian population their share achieved 10% of the population or above. And you would see that quite many places uh, in the Carpathian Basin have a Hungarian minority where their proportion is above 
ten percent. So this is just a beginning summary, not the final summary of the trends. I will illustrate the the changes of the use in the in in the place names uh, with the map extracts. You see four map extracts from the northwest of Hungary, where Austria and Slovakia, or sometimes Czechoslovakia, uh, is covered. Then on the northeast with Hungary and Ukraine or Soviet Union at the time, in the south with Serbia, and the interesting one in the east, where part of Transylvania and part of uh, Moldova is shown from Romania. Um, I highlighted here in yellow the, the most important information about the 67 and the 89 atlas. Um, I also highlighted the last line on the maps on diplomatic relations. Well, it's interesting because the way we use the place names on the map of uh, diplomatic relations is different from the general concept. I also add that these two atlases, national atlases, did not include in their preface any information on how we use the place names. Um, this will happen only in the, the latest, in the last national atlas, where the preface to the atlas gives uh, detailed information on the policy of place names use. Um, in this map, uh, um, in the following maps, I indicated in red rectangles the settlement names and in blue any, any other name, not, not only lakes but, but also mountains and, and others. You see that there is no difference between, between the names usage in, in the two national atlases. Um, you will see that uh, in the first place you find it been and below that uh, uh, the Hungarian Beach and also for Bratislava uh, or Pozsony. Well, we didn't indicate the German name, the present anyway, but it's a Hungarian national atlas. The 81, uh, sorry, published in 89 in two languages, but the maps were just in Hungarian. In this case, you find, in fact, no changes just in the, just in the topography. It's, it's interesting also that Fertu or Lake of Neusiedl, Neusiedl is not given in German either. Just a few settlement names are given in the, uh, in the German. Um, on the other end, uh, the, on the Ukrainian border, that time the Soviet Union border, the Cyrillic script, the names in Cyrillic script were um, transliterated into Hungarian and we used also on the first place the antonym and in parentheses the Hungarian name. As I said, everything had a Hungarian name as well. As for the diplomacy map, that's interesting because on the left you see that uh, only one version of the name was used and in the H and I map also and just one version, but another, but another version. Um, if you look at the left one, you see that it's only been, but no Hungarian name. And uh, in the 89, you can just see the Hungarian name. So it turned out that we used been in four versions in, in these two editions, either been beach, beach been, or just been, or just beach. Oh, there, there were four names or, or two names, but in various combinations. Um, the 67 atlas also included under the map a list of, uh, of uh, towns or countries where we have diplomatic uh, relations or where they are represented. Here they use the, the international transcription kind of international transcription. You get Athena at the, at the very beginning with New Delhi, although that was a Hungarian national atlas just in Hungarian, yet they gave the these place names in their native language in antonyms. 
In the 89 Atlas, uh, this map or, or, or this table or, or figure was not included, but they added something interesting from 89, the, the list of publishers who, who, who gave out uh, publications in Hungary and abroad. And there are several publishers listed here that were absolutely anti-socialist, I would say anti-communist publishers. And here, uh, they are given in Hungarian on the first place, while on, on the maps, this was just the opposite. And uh, in parentheses, we gave the, the endonym. Well, I say we, well, I was not involved in that anyway. I just identify myself with my cartographic ancestor. Um, if we get to the preliminary national atlas, I, sometimes say from 2009 and 11, just uh, a few uh, important in, some in information. There have been two separate volumes now uh, with a difference of publishing of uh, two years. Um, the no place names index, no information on, on the policy of using place names. You have to discover that or deduce it from studying the, the open pair of the maps. Um, everything in the English edition, because this was published uh, uh, earlier, uh, first the endonyms, of course, but in a few cases where the English name existed, we used only the English name. There were one or two exceptions that way, where, where the scale allowed it. And in the Hungarian one, in fact, uh, this was already a, uh, um, probably the same idea behind that and the one before the latest national atlas. Um, all settlement names were in Hungarian only in the Hungarian edition, no endonyms. Um, two examples of maps, one from um, the eastern part, well, well, the map shows the eastern part of Transylvania and the western part of Moldova in, in Romania. The, the, pad, the red patch shows the area where the Hungarian is, language is in or Hungarian eth eth ethnic people are in majority, quite a large area, although this is only a part of it. Um, in the English uh, ed edition, only the endonyms are used, but in the Hungarian one, only the Hungarian names are shown. Um, there was some discussion among the editor editors of the Atlas uh, whether, say, Unfalvad, that you can see on the right, is a place name that Hungarians know. No, very few people know that name. However, I, I Baraj Unkur in, in the talk. Uh, however, I took to some people from very small villages. In, in, from these areas, from the Chandu areas, and they said that, that they were uh, very, very moved to read that their name in the local language, in the Hungarian language, the national language of Hungary, that they were included as, as, as a people as, as well. So this is a novelty. Some people said that, why do you use place names that uh, only few people know? Yes, so we, we did because the, even if it's called a preliminary national atlas, but if we do not register it and we do not send it out to schools in, in those areas, then these names might soon disappear. Um, this is just showing the physical features over here in, in Moldova. They said, you see on the left, the, everything is in English, if there was something in English, like uh, down here, the Humash Pass on the left hand corner, we had the word pass, but on the, on the right, of course, uh, the Humash Soj, let's say, in Hungarian. And in the south of Hungary with, with Serbia, of course, the, the case of the principle is the same. With red, you will see the Hungarian, oh, sorry, the other way, the Hungarian area. Again, the diplomacy map is a strange one. Um, 
it, it's, uh, it's a bit against the uh, against the principles. Uh, on, on, on the left, in the English edition, that everything is in uh, uh, is in English. Just look at Vatican City or uh, places like Bucharest. Why in the Hungarian one on the right, you see just the Hungarian and no no endonyms are used. Um, let's get to the well, to the latest one in two thousand and two. 18 and 21, two atlases, um, with, a, with a long and meaningful preface to the atlas by the editor-in-chief, um, where uh, it describes that the, well, in, in the introduction of in the preface, it says that uh, the area covered by the atlas is much bigger than that of Hungary, it's half a million square kilometer of Central Europe, but large part of Central Europe. Um, this area of half a million square kilometers is, is as big as the Iberian Peninsula. It came from Central Europe to the center of the Iberian Peninsula, but it is in fact in, in, in the center. Um, just imagine that collecting information for more than 30,000 settlements, there are very detailed maps, not only of Hungary, but by the it's broader name, neighborhood and collecting and processing data and unifying uh, the classification that went from the radio. But this afternoon we will have two more presentations of the Hungarian National Atlases and uh, uh, they will give you further details on, 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 on editing. Um, the Carpathian Basin and the Pannonian Basin very often causes misunderstanding what they mean by these two terms. So the a map like that here uh, explains to you the difference between the usage of those two. Um, we also know that the, that the use of the term Carpathian Basin sometimes causes um, well, so some people around Hungary don't like that when we use the term Carpathian Basin because they think that we, this term, we wish to go back to the old historical Hungary at least in, 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 in our mind. Well, therefore, uh, it was clearly stated in the Atlas that it has no any irredentistic connotation uh, for Hungarians. We do not, we Hungarians, we do not use it in, in that way. Um, the Pannonian Basin is um, well, about 85% uh, of the two terms uh, cover the, the, the same area, in fact, so they, they overlap but we thought it uh, important to, to make this difference, differentiation. Um, the place names uh, for Hungarian readers, uh, we also explained it, well, in, in Hungarian, of course, in the Hungarian uh, ed edition, we uh, emphasized that uh, the mother tongue vocabulary has to be kept and the atlases, particular national atlas, uh, has a mission in, in this sense. Um, in the practice also appreciated the, the role of Hungarian cartographers and geographers in the, in the editing and publishing and compiling the National Atlas for, for about 50 years. Yeah, they deserved that uh, this sentence in, 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 the, in, in the preface. As explained in the Hungarian volume, everything is in Hungarian. There, there are very, very few and endonyms, and sometimes the endonyms are given when the scale allowed, or otherwise, or otherwise not. Um, it's also unique in, the, in this atlas that at the end you will find the names index. In the former publications, there were no names index at all, and no introductory sentences of the usage of the names either. Um, this list of Hungarian foreign place names, but well, you will see an extract of that as well. Now, particularly for international readers, we thought it important to emphasize that, well, what we see is not only Hungary by the, by the wider divide and the neighborhood of Hungary, because uh, not only because there are many Hungarian people, Hungarian speakers around us or we're part of Hungary, and there were lots of historical maps in that way, historical, I mean, historical data. 
starts starting from the 11th and 12th century sometimes. Um, therefore, to, to give a, um, a complete picture of Hungary and, and Hungary's past, we thought it important to, to set Hungary in a broader environment where we have the data that depended also from, from that. Um, well, as stated, the country's official language, uh, uh, um, the names in the country's official language uh, is given only when there is no Hungarian name. Uh, 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 well, sorry. <laughs> names of settlements are, are given in English in the first place. And um, uh, if it does not exist, then we gave the, the given country uh, the given country's official name. Or, there were not too many, uh, many cases. The novelty is the 10% uh, of, of the minority share. Um, if it existed, then also the Hungarian name appeared uh, with the entry, of course. Um, and the place name index, yes, which is a, a great uh, value to, to the Atlas, and the place name index is quite rich. Place name index is shown at the end, and the equivalents in, in, in other languages. Now, part two, so it's a, kind of a summary now. Um, uh, I compared uh, three names: one from Austria, the other from the Austrian capital, then the Slovakian capital, and uh, a border town, but in, in Ukraine, uh, Beresas in Hungary, and it's still this. Officially, they use the Cyrillic script, and as we go down, you see the development of five decades or the changes of five decades. H, the letter H under the year, expresses the, the language H for Hungarian and E, of course, for the English language uh, additions. And um, in some places, down at uh, B, or Vienna, or, or, or Bratislava, you find a, a question mark. Well, the answer, I'll give you the answer that's there. In some cases, but only in a few cases, they were also given those in parentheses, well, depending on the scale uh, of, the, uh, of the map. But the tendency or the trend can be clearly seen that in the first uh, atlases, the endonyms were on the plate or on the first place. Then today, the Hungarian name is of the of the first place, or just the Hungarian name is shown in the Hungarian atlas. While in the English one, the tradition is just the opposite. It is endonym is the first place all the time, and if there is an English name of that place, then it was shown. Um, and some physical features: um, the, the Danube. Well, this is the only river, in fact, in, in Hungary that has a as an English name, well, it has several names in Europe. Uh, it, the Danube is not in England, yet it has got an English name. As for Jitnu Ustrov, cut on top, uh, on top, you see the original spelling of the name that's in, in Slovakian, but it's, uh, uh, it's a place for Hungarians as well. Well, in some places, 80 90% of the people, the settlements are uh, uh, Hungarians. Therefore, we thought it important that also in the, in the English edition, uh, uh, down at the bottom, we also give the Hungarian name, although here the percentage of the Hungarian minority is well above 10%, well, well above. Um, yes. Um, in, in, in the First column with the Prushka Gora Cyrillic script. Well, this was not shown in the 97 edition. Um, you see the Hungarian name from 2018, Tartsal where we are being revived, a name that only few people know in, in, in Hungary. We hope that now more and more people will know, although in Hungarian literature, in fiction, and also from historical books, this name can be found. But somehow, in the past in the past eighty years, it has unfortunately uh, disappeared. As for the Hungarian Dunatisa uh, formerly we used the English name, 
uh, in the English edition, uh, the Danube is an interview. Uh, however, some uh, native speakers of English and also the, uh, the English review has said that the the uh, interflu word is a very specific word in English, and many simple English people wouldn't understand what it is. So we coined a word, well, it exists in uh, the, the Midland, the Danube is a Midland, not, not a Midland, that's in England, just the Midland, which uh, expresses much better that this Midland is a very large area, about 20, 25% of the total area of Hungary. So the interflu reduce the meaning of the, to, to an area close to the confluence of the, of the two rivers, as they explained it, it, it to me. Um, in the right-hand uh, column, the Munti, or the Romanian, the Jedo mountains are also given in Hungaria. I only emphasize the mountains because in the area, the Hungarians are in majority. Therefore, also in English. Um, this is the ethnic map, or, or an extract of the ethnic map of the Carpathian Basin. On the left, the Austrians, North Slovaks, and the Reds are, are Hungarians, well beyond the border in Slovakia. Here it, in fact, summarizes what, what I was talking about that in the, in the Hungarian edition that you see on top, probably the Hungarian names for for Wien, as well as Beige, also for, for Join, which used to be the Hungarian coronation town for centuries and day. It's now the capital of Slovakia. And also for Komarom, or that was one city uh, before the First World War, until the First World War. Uh, both names, uh, on the northern part went to Slovakia, the southern remained in Hungary, but they have the same name in Hungarian, both are Komarom, Therefore, we used only one name in, in this square, Komarom, uh, uh, because uh, there is no Hungarian, no, no Slovakian naming the difference. Um, and at the bottom, uh, you, you see the English version, uh, the English name for Vienna appears, and then the local endonyms come. Uh, the names index uh, first, in, uh, you see the uh, how it appeared in the Hungarian uh, edition, or in Hungarian, but in the names index, the name variants in the concert countries are, are also, also given. And you can see the same with the English names, uh, that the local names mm -hmm. in the countries concerned are also given in, in details. And, oh, sure, you know that this is going to be the last slide. Uh, the certificate of the International Cartographic Association that uh, was uh, given in the, respecting the cartographic execution, the content of the atlas, and probably also the use of the of the toponyms in the atlas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabor, for this keynote. It was especially interesting because you drew this comparison from the current atlas, from the new national atlas of Hungary, older, with older versions of the atlas. And it showed clearly that uh, this increase of axonomy use, the intensification of axonomy use, in the communist period, axonomy use were banned, so to say, as an ex they were demonized as an expression of nationalism and so on. But now, are used again because they are vital parts of the language of the national atlas. It's very justified as an experience because it is a representation of the country, an image of self of the country, so to say, a representation of the country with, a, with its own population, but um, external. Um, uh, um, I, I saw in the, in the foreword uh, on this, in, in this information. Uh, on the on, on base name use in the atlas, um, ethnonymy, the term ethnonymy, in the sense of minority names. Uh, but the usual, the usual meaning of ethnonymy is rather the name of the ethnic community of Roma. It's part and the name of Roma is an ethnonymy. So, yeah, right. you used it in the. 
So, I think we still have some time for questions, perhaps, and, and, uh, and comments, perhaps not only from the, but also from our remote uh, um, visitors and all auditors. Question or comment? Well, in the afternoon, there will be two more presentations. Yes, like yes, we will hear more about this, so we can ask more specifically and hear the other presentations. So perhaps we can close the session now. So thank you again, Gabo, for your very interesting keynote presentation, and thank you, audience, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.